Good morning, everyone, and welcome back from the network uh, break. Our next speaker we are going to hear from is Dr. Raj G. Iyer. He is the Chief Information Officer for Information Technology Reform in the Office of the Secretary of the Army. As CIO, Dr. Iyer serves as the Principal Advisor and directs all matters representing the Secretary of the Army relating to information management and information technology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Iyer. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hey, pleasure to be here at my first do this conference. I hope I survive. And uh, I know I'm interacting with the IC community here for the first time, so let's see how it goes. Um, so what I want to do today is, you know, we've got 30 minutes. I'm not going to do Q&As, but I really wanted to spend some time talking to you about the journey we began on digital, digitally transforming the Army of two plus years ago, where we are today, because you know, obviously many of you are tracking some tremendous efforts and initiatives underway. Those of you who follow me on LinkedIn probably track and just, just got a bunch of stuff going on right now. So wanted to really kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we are, where we're headed, some of the big strategic choices we've made as an army. So let's see. There we go. So why, why is the army on this journey? You have heard our secretary and the chief talk about this many, many, many times. For the Army to be successful in deterring, you know, facing challenges like China in the future, really is about us getting to establishing strategic deterrence. And that strategic deterrence for us is how we can fight and win with multi-domain operations. Giving our commanders multiple options, both kinetic and non-kinetic, and then enabling what we call decision advantage or decision dominance. And that is about giving our commanders data at the point of need in real time to enable them to make decisions in real time against an adversary that's pretty sophisticated. And for us to be able to succeed and win those kinds of wars and fights, it's very clear that we have to take a very different approach than what we've been doing for the last 20 years, fighting counterinsurgency. As much as we were successful fighting and winning at the brigade combat team and the battalion level and lower, it's very clear that for us to be successful in future with large-scale combat operation, it requires a whole different way of us fighting, a whole different way of the Army structuring or restructuring our force to be able to take advantage of technology and data. And for us to be able to rapidly adopt digital commercial technologies at a scale and at a pace that we have never in the past. That is the imperative. And there's, there's no ifs and buts about it, and there's no plan Bs or plan Cs. If you, when, you, when you hear our chief, McConnell, talk, he'll tell you, we're here to fight and win the nation's wars, and winning matters. There's no second places. And that is a challenge that we're here set out to accomplish. So this journey that we've been on, you know, digital transformation is all about us transforming the entire United States Army to be able to fight and win with data. Our weapon system platforms are most sophisticated platforms, and even the ones that we continue to build through our modernization priorities will continue to play a key role in delivering, in delivering effects, delivering lethality at a range and a scale that we haven't in the past. But as I said earlier, for us to be truly successful in multi-domain, it's about how we integrate all these effects and how we integrate data across platforms, across systems, across sensors to enable our commanders to make the right decisions at the right time. So what's fueling all of this? The most recent uh, field manual 3.0 that the Army released three months ago, you know, you don't have to read more than the first 10 pages of it. It's, it's a pretty thick volume, but I'm telling you, if you read the first 10 pages of it, it shows how the Army is fundamentally changing how we're going to fight in future. This is our doctrine. This is our doctrinal manual that says how we're going to fight in future in multi-domain. And every page you read through it is about data. You may not call out data specifically, right? It talks about, you know, the importance um, of data in, in, in many, many, many of these things. 
How do we see ourselves? How do we see the enemy better? How do we get to situational awareness and situational understanding? How do we make sure that we are able to hide in plain sight in contested environments? How do we make sure that we maneuver in, 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 uh, without, you know, in, in, in a small footprint than what we've used to? How do we make sure that we reduce the size and complexity of our command posts so that we're much more distributed in terms of command and control? All of these concepts are now codified in how we're going to fight in the future. And oh, by the way, for us to be able to succeed in doing that, we now have to really completely rethink how we've architected the army from a digital infrastructure perspective. Used to be, this is what we used to call the network in the past. I don't like to use the word network anymore. The networks of the past were how we were able to go fight at the BCT level. What we're talking about here is really establishing a digital ecosystem a global infrastructure that enables us to pass data at scale, at echelon, worldwide, to enable decision making in large theaters. So, a year and a half ago, we established the Army's first digital transformation strategy. Since then, we've followed it up with a number of more specific plans, such as the Army's data plan, the Army cloud plan, the Army's unified networking plan. Each of them, over the last 18 months or so, are now, have, have, have gotten us enough momentum where we're actually now starting to see results. And I'm gonna walk you through some of them. So, I got, I got, a pl I got plenty of help from, our, from my boss, the secretary. When she came on last year, she noted that getting to a data-centric army was her two of six top objectives for her role um, as the Army's 25th Secretary of the Army. And that means a lot, that says a lot. This is not one that's being driven by the CIO. This is one that's being driven by the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Army. And so when, when she says we gotta ensure the Army becomes more data-centric to conduct operations in contested environments, that means a lot. And that has led to the domino effects across the Army today in terms of us looking at force structure, looking at all of our platforms and weapon systems and where they need to be, looking and re-looking our cyber posture to see whether we're protecting all of our attack surface area at this, at, with the agility that's needed, with the resiliency that's needed, and oh, by the way, how do we make sure we do that by continuously bringing in innovation at scale? Not just pockets of the Army, but starting at the grassroots level and up. So, as I said, data-centric Army is now in doctrine. And what that means is, it's no longer the tech geeks in the Army that own this. It's the warfighter. It's senior leaders, starting with senior leaders down to core, you know, theater commanders, core commanders, division commanders, down to the individual soldier. Everybody now has a role to play in getting to a data-centric army. So this kind of mass transformation effort, if you look at, you know, how other large industries have done this on the commercial side, can take years and years and years. We don't have years and years and years. And so what I have done as a CIO really is to help accelerate this effort in a few ways. One is to make sure that we establish a common set of tools, platforms, digital ecosystems to help the Army innovate. The last thing you want a core commander to do is to have to worry about IT and all the barriers that comes to adopting cloud. That's not their job. But that's typically how the Army has operated in the past, which has been very, very decentralized and letting the commands and the units to have to go struggle with whatever they gotta do. Our approach now is to make sure that we are providing all of the digital tools available in the commercial marketplace in a fully accredited, highly secured environment so that our warfighters can now talk, start to take that and take advantage of those tools to really do what they know best, which is warfighting. How do you fight with data as your new ammunition? How does, the, 
how does the digital ecosystem, the digital infrastructure, now become your warfighting platform? And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. But the other thing here, too, is really, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to enabling optionality for our commanders, enabling mission command, enabling common situational and understanding, a common operating picture. For all of you folks in the IC world, you've done this before. You know what I'm talking about on the Title 50 side. On the Title 10 side of the house, extremely complicated. And that's just only because of how we have been prosecuting our operations for the last 20 years. But the way, we, the way things stand right now is that this is for us to be successful as an army, and that for us, that's the Army of 2030, that's our objective. This has got to happen at every echelon in the army. Every, every leader, every soldier needs to understand how they're going to take and leverage data as a strategic asset and how we empower them to make decisions at echelon with the best data, the, the, the highest quality of data that's available to them. So the Army Digital Transformation Strategy, written, like I said, almost two years ago, had three lines of effort, uh, three major objectives, 13 lines of effort. And almost two years later, I can tell you that we've checked every one of these boxes today to say that, yes, this is done. We got, we, this is the vision we laid out. And yes, we have, we're well on our way to be able to implement and execute the vision that we've laid out. And because this is transformation, this cannot just be about technology. And that's why this is not a technology strategy. This is all, always about digital transformation because, again, if you, you know, if you Google what digital transformation is about, it's about changing your operating model. It's changing your business model. It's changing fundamentally how you operate, leveraging data in ways that you know, your, 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 either your competitor or your peer has not figured it out and you're disrupting the market. For the Army, that's disrupting the warfighting market. That's the business we're in. And so for us to be successful doing that, obviously a huge component of leveraging digital technologies such as cloud and AI and, 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 and cyber, and we'll talk about that. But it's also making sure there's two other pieces of the, the puzzle that are equally important. How do we reform our processes, our institutional processes that are not so agile? And making sure that they can move at the speed at which we want digital to move in the Army. And whether that's the acquisition process or whether it's the requirements process, every one of those things have to move at the speed at which the Army of the future needs to be at. And, and so absolutely critical that, that we look at it as well. And then the last piece is people and partnerships. We know, you know from current operations and, and what's going on in Europe that one of our key strategic deterrents is really our ability to bring our coalition partners with us. And so making sure that we are able to share, collaborate, and exchange data with our partners at a scale that we have in the past especially in new geographic areas and new theaters where we don't have robust um, partnerships such as NATO is going to be key to success. And then obviously transforming in the, the, you know, the size, and, size and scale of the United States Army means that at the end of the day, fighting and winning with data and all the, on the digital technologies means that we absolutely have to reskill our workforce across the board, the total Army, to be able to truly understand and leverage what it means to be able to fight with these new technologies. So where are we with this journey? So two, two plus years ago, we started on, we, we literally had nothing called a cloud. And two plus years later, we have probably the most robust, sophisticated cloud ecosystem in the DOD that's being operationalized by the warfighter not just as a back office computer and store environment, but we're gonna talk about how we're actually allowing our cores and divisions to experiment with this digital infrastructure as part of all of the experimentation and exercises. And that is a huge game changer, and that, that is how, 
at the end of the day, if we need to move large volumes of data across the globe and enable decision dominance, that cannot happen when you have a whole bunch of data sources all over the place and a bunch of data centers connected through networks that are not resilient and then having to work through a whole bunch of cybersecurity layers to get access to it. That is just simply not survivable and is definitely not resilient for a future fight. So cloud is an absolute necessity. There's just no way this will happen without the cloud. Cloud brings scale, elasticity, resiliency, and oh, by the way, the advantage of cloud is that you're now able to leverage a commercial platform and you're now able to process, store, and manage information in a zero trust cybersecurity architecture where essentially our adversary cannot make us out from any other traffic or any other data that's in the commercial cloud. And that is how, if you, if you talk to our three stars and four stars, our, our, you know, our core commanders, our theater commanders, the one thing that they have in mind, the one thing that they ask of me is, how do we make sure that we hide in plain sight? How do we make sure that we start to transition away from all of the things that we have built in the Army that's militarily unique to the Army for the last 20 years? How do we transition away from that to leveraging a lot more commercial? Because everything that's that is uniquely military, everything that we've built over the last 20 years, whether it's the networks, whether it's SATCOM, whether it's our regional hub nodes, whether it's our, all our different points of presence, our fiber, they are all either contested or worse, could be completely degraded um, and made completely unusable by a sophisticated peer adversary. So it's important to make sure that we are now relooking this whole war fighting business from the perspective of you know, leveraging commercial infrastructure, commercial transport, but all that means, it's a, it's a, that's a huge culture change. That's not how we've operated. We're, we're all, I mean, when you talk to the, the, the network folks in the Army, they'll tell you, hey, I got Nipper, I got Sipper, and I got to keep the two separate because they've always been separate, right? We've always said we, there has to be physical separation of data. Physical separation of data is not a good thing from an adversary perspective. Yeah, that's what they want you to do because now they can, they can clearly make you out. They know where you are. So getting to you know, being transport agnostic, being able to leverage any commercial transport globally, being able to leverage the highest level of quantum resistant encryption, to be able to move different classifications of data on the, in the, on the same transport is the journey we're on. Because that's the only way we're gonna achieve that that's the only way we're going to be survivable in the future. It also means that, you know, as our core commanders are looking at things like distributed command and control, where we're trying to move away from what we've always done in the Army is, you know, a hub and spoke approach to command posts, where we try to, you know, consolidate decision making at a command post and where we put everything we need in one place is not survivable. And so if that's the case now, what we have to do is we got to break things out where your command and control is much more mobile, much more distributed. It's, it's on the move, which means that you cannot expect to have access or connectivity to your data in one place at one time. It means that you now have to look at, you know, splitting out all of the different warfighting functions and then make them all completely distributed and mobile. So that again is a whole different way of saying that, okay, can't count on your infrastructure to be in one place. Your data has to be now distributed all the way to the tactical edge. Your networking has to be distributed. Heck of a lot more reliance on use of things like commercial Leo and Mio and SATCOM on the move. That is just gonna be the nature of the game. 
And oh, by the way, doing all of this, like I said, with the right cybersecurity defensive overwatch on it. Because as you bring more commercial technologies, more commercial infrastructure, it's a very different operating environment where how we work with commercial industry and how we share and exchange information with them, understanding the roles and responsibilities, absolutely critical to make sure that they understand how we're truly, truly leveraging their infrastructure. So the other piece too is then making sure we get access to this data from any device, from any place. If you are a commander and the only way for you to get access to data is on a government furnished equipment that's connected or needs a VPN connection to some wired network, again, as, as I noted earlier, that's just not gonna be how we fight in future. So it's gotta be where we enable our warfighters to be able to access data from any device anywhere. And this is where all of our efforts around getting to virtual desktops is so important. If the data is in the cloud and that's where it resides and you're able to leverage commercial transport to get to that data anywhere in the globe, then you should be able to bring any device to be able to get access to it. So again, this is one of those, play, one of those things where digital technologies and how what we have today that's available today is actually influencing and changing the nature of warfighting. Is technology enabled? It's no longer where the network, as they used to call it in the past, was a supporter or, or an enabling function. These digital technologies are now fundamentally changing you know, how we're looking at warfighting. So our ecosystem is now ready to go across you know, this four-tier architecture, all the way from Oconus commercial cloud to us expanding our footprint into Oconus Army Enterprise private cloud, down to a command post with some kind of edge computing infrastructure, and then even down to a dismounted soldier if needed. If you're all tracking what our IVAS program is, our integrated visual augmentation system, it is all about us bringing um, AI and compute into um, AR, VR headsets at the individual soldier level and enabling full situational understanding. So this fabric, this cloud fabric is ready to go. And what we have done is really enabled, as I noted, our warfighters to take advantage of it and start to experiment and see how, this is how they're gonna fight in this new digital ecosystem. So some of the bold moves that we've made to modernize the Army of 2030, and as I noted, these are bold. Distributed command and control requires distributed data at echelon. And as I noted, the only way to do this is through cloud. We have, we have made a strategic choice that as much as we, you know, speed is important, it's also important that getting access to data and making sure it's truly open and available and accessible at the point of need is just as important. And so we're beyond the days of us, you know, getting locked into proprietary platforms where the data cannot be leveraged outside of the platform. I know the IC community has gone through the same level of maturity in the past and there's some tremendous lessons learned. And we continue to work with all of the stakeholders in this ecosystem to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel here. Modular architectures are no longer just buzzwords that are thrown. We have to make sure we decouple the network or the transport from the hardware, from the software, from the application, from the data. Like these all have to be pieces that have to be able to, that we have to be able to break out. Because that's what the warfighting approach calls for. If everything's gonna be packed together in one place and you can't move things, pieces around, it constrains our ability to be able to do distributed command and control. And that's why modular open source architectures are so important. Getting to cloud native and cloud first is a decision that we have made. It's no longer where we're saying, hey, cloud is plan B, cloud is plan A. And we have made a conscious decision that we're no longer procuring any more hardware infrastructure in the Army. 
So even when we do operate our Army Enterprise private cloud environments, what that means is it's an Army infrastructure, Army facility, but then we get commercial hyperscalers to come in and provision the compute and store within our facilities to enable that private cloud infrastructure. And the reason for that is when you have that common operating environment established, it's very easy for us to push common services all the way from the strategic to the tactical. And this is where the cloud plays such a huge, huge role in enabling that integration because you're no longer siloed. You have the same sort of common services like identity management that you can now push all the way from the strategic to the tactical. Leo and Mio are huge game changers and will continue to be. We've already shown in current operations in support of Ukraine today how critical these assets play. And over, over the next five years, we're gonna see an exponential growth in terms of additional commercial SATCOM coming on in theaters that currently, you know, may not, we may not have the best coverage. But again, this is the Army leveraging investments that the private sector has already made. We will never be able to compete with the billions of dollars that the Amazons and the SpaceX of the world, the Googles of the world are putting in place when it comes to transport. And they have a business interest in doing that. They want to make sure every individual in any part of the world can get access to the Netflix movies that's in the cloud. That's what's driving their business decisions. All we're saying is, hey, we just want to be a piece of that. <clears throat> DevSecOps and how we build software applications is the way of how we're going to start doing things moving forward. And again, these are all decisions that we made over the last nine months in the Army through capability portfolio reviews led by the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and the Undersecretary of the Army. Which means that if we really did DevSecOps, there's no such thing called sustainment. No more sustainment for digital solutions in the Army we will be in this persistent modernization effort to ensure that as the threat environment changes, as needs and requirements from the warfighter change, we are able to respond rapidly with new software applications and solutions. And then really, really big is user experience. Not an afterthought anymore. We're no longer talking about soldier touch points after everything's all baked and then you get their feedback. And then when it's, they don't like it, we go like, hey, too bad. This is that, if we did human-centered design first or soldier-centered design, it's about putting the soldier first and then building around it with real soldier inputs and requirements driving what we need. That's what DevSecOps is about. So we can't say we're doing one but not the other. And that's, again, a big change in terms of how we work the requirements process and some of these other institutional processes. Also in user experience, it does, it's not just on the warfighting side, it's the generating force as well. And this is another area where we have made some tremendous advancements over the last six months or so with things like bring your own device, virtual desktop infrastructure, and other capabilities that enable our users to be able to get access to data in the cloud from any device, from anywhere in the world. If we can't make that work for regular office users, how, how are we gonna truly operationalize this in a tactical environment? In terms of bold moves that we're doing to reform the Army, as I noted, the capability portfolio reviews, CPRs, took literally the entire Army for us to reassess all of our requirements in the digital portfolio, many that had been written about 10 years ago when we were still in, we were still, you know, in counterinsurgency operations, and ensuring alignment to the Army of 2030. Is that truly meet the requirements of large-scale combat operation? Is it truly in support of multi-domain operations? Re-establishing priorities, ensuring synchronization, ensuring deduplication, ensuring that we don't have a separate tactical requirement and a set of solutions and capabilities on one side, 
and then a whole different set on the enterprise. Because that's not what we're talking about here. We're no longer making that distinction. The unified network and, and, and the ability for us to move data seamlessly across the spectrum means that we no longer can make these artificial distinctions that we've done in the past. We've made conscious decisions to le fully leverage existing acquisition authorities and things like the software acquisition pathways. Congress has given us these authorities. We just haven't operationalized them at scale on large complex programs. So that's the decision that the Army has made to do that. Maximizing everything as a service. This changes the whole model of how we procure and how we buy and how we support and sustain things. If we really want to keep up with pacing threats, especially in the cyber domain, and we want continuous modernization, we got to make sure that we absolutely are able to leverage everything as a service. But as I noted, the caveat there is making sure we understand the roles and responsibilities between us and commercial service providers across the spectrum of you know, digital technologies. Talent management is huge. We've made some tremendous progress this year under General Barrett's leadership at our Army Cyber Command with establishing the Cyber Accepted Service. And in 23 and 24, I expect that across the Army, everybody, the cyber workforce, will be on this new talent management system with much greater flexibilities to enable our workforce to for not just bring in the best workforce, but also to retain them. But what we found Cloud to do is that we really are starting to centralize more and more services, because that is the nature of the cloud. When everybody was running their own data centers and they had their own shadow IT and they had their own contractors running their local services, that's how the last 20 years of the Army was. When we have moved so much to the cloud, including our office productivity environment, our collaboration tools, what we're seeing is that the, now is the time to pivot, and we have made that pivot by saying, hey, the Army is now going to deliver centralized services to everybody with the right service levels to make sure that every, it's, it's standardized. And that, from, as a C, from a CIO's perspective, some tremendous cost savings and efficiencies to be got from taking that approach. And all of these we address through the capability portfolio reviews. And finally, for everybody that knows the building, you got to follow the money. And we had to make sure that how we were budgeting and executing the Army $16 billion budget, annual budget, was efficient, was agile, was responsive to the changes that we needed, and reflected all the decisions that we had made. So we are now on a new path forward with a subset of the Army's budget, with the CIO and my counterpart, General Morrison, the G6, now co-chair the oversight for all this funding all the way from the initial planning through execution. Not letting commands do this, not getting it distributed where there's all this distribution and siloing, but ensuring that we're now able to provide the right oversight and managing this from a centralized perspective. Big, big changes. So as I noted, the persistent experimentation to data readiness, all of this that we're doing here really is to support our warfighters figure out how they're going to fight in future. So the other thing that we've done in my office is to make sure that we've embedded ourselves in all of the experimentation, not just project convergence. Project convergence is a huge success in terms of us looking at how we can bring in modern technologies and, and um, and, and making sure that you know, we can validate them from an operational perspective. But it's also all of the different warfighter exercises. It's Scarlet Dragon from the 18th Airborne Corps. It's all of the ex ex exercises that USERPAC and the First Corps are doing in, in the Indo-Pacific. It's us working with our sister services on things like Northern Edge. And Scarlet Dragon at CENCOM in, 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 you know, in, in, a, in a couple of months. So this digital ecosystem now supports the joint force and our combatant commanders. And it's allowing the Army to look at ourselves as part of the joint force to see how we can be structured and how we can bring the best to the COCOM commander in a future fight. 
And so what we've done deliberately is to make sure that we connect up all of these exercises and, ex and experimentations so that they're not just individual siloed events that get done and then move on to the next, but really that we now have a path where we're incrementally building digital capabilities as we go for the next 18 months. The first one might be building a tactical computing, um, a cloud, in, cloud infrastructure in one exercise. And in the next exercise, we might take that to say, okay, we're now gonna enable a mission partner environment using that. The third one might be, okay, we now we take those two and then we link it up with Leo and Mio, right? So we now have established not just learning objectives for these exercises and experiments, but a clear roadmap when it comes to capabilities for how we're gonna incrementally build the capabilities out with the foundation that we have, but truly in support of operations and, and, and tailoring it to uh, the warfighter needs. This is the journey that we're on. This is Army-wide. This includes, as I noted, four shark commands on logistics side for contested logistics, on the warfighting side with the cores and ASCCs, with Army Cyber Command playing a key role in terms of making sure that we have you know, both defensive and offensive cyber capabilities integrated into the, the effects that we deliver. This is an army-wide effort to make sure that now we can take and leverage data as a new ammunition. So key takeaways, I think in just two years, we have set the army on a strategic sustainable path for the army of 2030 like we've never have for the last 30 years. The change and the pace at which we've made these changes at the grass, at the, all the way from the grassroots level up to the senior most levels of the Army, and how we've been able to get everybody fully aligned on the vision, the objectives, the roles and responsibilities, is one that I think is, 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 is irreversible momentum now for the Army. There is no going back. Every leader in the Army now at Echelon understands what it is to fight with data. Just a year ago, I couldn't have made that statement. I can tell you now, every one of our commanders are hungry. They want to establish their own common operating pictures. They want their own, they, they, you know, the ability to be able to build and integrate workflows and automation into their unit level processes so they can move off of analog processes and, and PowerPoints to f truly leveraging data from authoritative data sources for decision making. There's a sense of urgency that everybody understands. You all know this. Change doesn't happen unless there's a sense of urgency. Our pacing challenge could be as early as 2027, and we don't have time. And, 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 and that pace at which we're moving now is one that everybody feels. We've created a whole army of change agents. What we've done is we've empowered every individual to say, question the status quo because the last 20 years of the Army ain't the next 20 years of the Army. And we have empowered every individual to say, do things different, look out of the box, think different, look greenfield. We cannot get from where we've been 20 years to the next 20 years by taking a brownfield, slow modernization approach. Some things we're just gonna have to rip and replace. And it's much faster to do that because we're leveraging commercial technologies. And finally, we've built some tremendous relationships across the community, whether it's the DOD CIO, you, talk, you heard Honorable Sherman talk about this yesterday. For the first time in the DOD, I can tell you that I, I spend more time with my counterpart CIOs in the Air Force and Navy and Mr. Sherman almost on a weekly basis than ever before. We're fully aligned on things like the Joint Warfighting Cloud. We know how we're gonna operationalize that. We're fully aligned on Zero Trust. We're fully aligned on how we're gonna to get to Secure Access Service Edge. We're fully aligned on things like ICAM. We're fully aligned on so many of these programs while enabling the services to uniquely tailor what's needed to meet our mission requirements. And that is the hard balance. But that can come when we collaborate and we talk. If it's, if this is no longer a one-size-fits-all approach. Our commanders are asking for flexibility optionality, agility. They're not asking for a lot of solutions. These are the three things they're asking for. 
which means that we got to make sure that we have every tool in the bag to bring to the future fight. So folks, this is what changing culture is all about. I think the future of the Army is strong and is digital strong. Thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you, Dr. Iyer, for the insightful uh, remarks. I will now turn the mic over to our, our moderator for our next panel, Ms. Anne-Marie Schumann, Senior Cyber Threat Advisor to the Director, Joint Staff, J6. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I've asked my panel members to come up and join me, and I'm going to keep my opening remarks very short, uh, mostly because Dr. Iyer apparently has delivered them all in a much better um, polished way than I was going to anyway. Um, but thank you for joining me today. Rear Admiral Breyer Joyner, Deputy Director of Joint Staff J6, sends her regrets. Um, she also sent me, Anne-Marie Schumann. I'm the Joint Staff J6 Senior Cyber Threat Advisor. And a large part of my job is integrating the Intel and Communications Directorates on the Joint Staff. So I'm really excited to be here attending my first DOTUS Worldwide Conference. Joining me today are Colonel Phillips from AFRICOM J6, Ms. Durham Ruiz from STRATCOM J6, and Mr. Yu from SPACECOM J6. I'll provide, as I said, some brief opening remarks, turn it over to our panelists for them to provide their remarks, and we'll reserve plenty of time at the end for question and answer from the audience. I apologize for being so much on my script and reading today. I could blame it on the short notice in, uh, in attending or the travel delays, but the truth is they really don't let me out of the Pentagon very much, so I need to not screw this up. Uh, <laughs> So as I was thinking today about what I should say to you uh, by way of introduction, I reflected on the year that I've spent in the Joint Staff and the 10 years that I spent at the Defense Intelligence Agency to try to identify those common linkages between intelligence and C4. And what I came up with really wasn't very groundbreaking, but it was that both of these disciplines use technology to convey information to support military operations and decision makers. And if we fail to communicate that information, we've failed our mission, full stop. So at this point, um, this is where I'm gonna start editing my remarks for the sake of time. Uh, I, was, I was going to, to put a point of emphasis here and ask you to remember it and then talk about a lot of things that many of our other speakers today have already spoken to you about, um, starting with information and how that's really just data put in context and what the future is of data to multi-domain operations, as you already heard Dr. Iyer talk about, um, and what that might look like in the future. Also, how we're on our way there, but our data is currently too siloed, too hard to find, too slow to enable the DOD to stay ahead of potential threats and maintain its competitive advantage in the future. And how we need to focus on addressing the issues of data security and integration, the volume of data that our warfighters are faced with today and our decision makers are faced with, data integration from multiple sources, and data ethics as well as data analytics, all themes that you've already heard about today. Foremost among those challenges, I think, is the, the development of the capability to share data. And this obviously goes far beyond the need to make intelligence releasable. What we're really talking about is that data fabric that connects data storage and management solutions across the enterprise. 
and that allows data to flow uh, between Title X, Title 50 systems, creating a unified view of the data and enabling data-driven dr decision-making. Our data fabric has to be uh, rapid enough to enable collaboration, integration, while also providing security and governance capabilities to ensure integration and the confidentiality of the data. However, as you've already heard, all that data can rapidly overwhelm decision makers without proper analytics. And this is where artificial intelligence has to be applied. Now, I could talk to you more about that. We've already heard AI. We know what it's supposed to do for us. AI um, is supposed to deliver this data at the speed and accuracy to face the complex and rapidly changing battlefield scenarios of tomorrow. In order to leverage the power of that AI, the final uh, piece that I was going to speak about at length, and now in short, uh, was the human aspect, which you've also heard uh, repeatedly again today, how in order to harness the power of artificial intelligence and all this ubiquitous data, the workforce of the future will need to have a strong understanding of data analysis, machine learning, programming languages, while also developing the soft skills to communicate and collaborate across cross-functional teams and harness the power of problem solving and critical thinking. Additionally, that workforce will need to understand the ethical implications of AI and be able to implement responsible AI practices. And at this point, this is where I was going to pull the big reveal. So the big reveal of all that uh, condensed information was at that point where I said full stop and then had about 10 minutes of prepared remarks. I wanted to emphasize that if you doubt the transformative power of AI or think that relevant applications are years away, about 61% of the remarks that I had originally prepared were generated by ChatGPT, an open AI uh, application, a large language model. Uh, and while I'd like to think that I'm a better writer than the AI, what it turns out is that uh, the AI is actually pretty good at the general level of capturing and delivering uh, these thoughts, not with the specificity that our other speakers have given you today, but at a competent, compelling level. And the point of all this, really, what I want to get at is that useful, relevant, and easily accessible AI has arrived. It's not tomorrow, it's here now. And that this really has to be a wake-up call to the department that the time to act is here. Or we risk losing our competitive advantage to our adversaries. And that the developments in data, in talent management, in interoperability, in AI cannot be sequential. We don't have the time. We have to partner across the CIO community, CDAO, the IC, the warfighter, academia, industry, uh, allies and partners in order to make this push, this leap into the future. The Joint Staff J6, for our part, is focused on prioritizing the operational requirements that enable the commander's decision cycle with this rapidly evolving technology landscape. Through Joint All-Domain Command and Control, we're accelerating the delivery of both material and non-material solutions for the fight tonight and in the future. But JADC2 can't be a concept that is just for the J6s of the world. Command and control doesn't function well when divorced from intelligence. And intelligence falls short if it's not fused with other sources of information and delivered at the right time and place. In the future, it won't be enough to have these intel systems um, that are fast, integrated, and AI-enabled over here, and these C2 capabilities that are the same over here. The joint force, our allies and partners, need these systems to communicate seamlessly at every echelon, in every domain. It's what the warfighter requires, and it's what we owe to the warfighter to deliver. And with that, I'm gonna sit down and get to the good part, turning it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and provide opening remarks.
All right, so good morning. Uh, Colonel Jesse Phillips, I am the AFRICOM J6. Uh, been in the seat for about 18 months. Uh, we're stationed out of Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a couple things. Uh, wanted to kind of set the stage to hopefully uh, lead to some very, very good questions. So uh, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Casa. Uh, of course, General Barrier for the invite. Uh, being back here in Texas uh, is, is a great opportunity to see some old friends and uh, coworkers, but also I did some command time up at Fort Hood in the 1st Cavalry Division, so it was good to come back to, uh, to Texas as well, get some good uh, barbecue and some good Tex-Mex. So on behalf of uh, General Mike Langley and Sergeant Major Richard Thresher, uh, thanks uh, for this opportunity to talk about the problem set and the opportunities that persist or really present themselves in the United States Africa Command. Uh, if you don't know, the, it's, it comprises of our components, but also it comprises of our 53 African partners that we work by, with, and through down on the continent. Uh, and the approach that General Langley is taking is it's really about the strategic uh, deterrence, but doing that so it's not a strategic distraction. And the two examples that he uses, uh, Tongo Tongo, uh, which occurred back in 2017, or as an ODA and uh, some uh, um, defense forces from Niger were ambushed and, and ended up uh, some uh, casualties there. How do we avoid that, but then go back even farther and we talk about Benghazi in 2012. How do we avoid those uh, situations or those events so it doesn't become a strategic distraction for our nation uh, and for our, the Department of Defense? So how do we do that? His approach is, goes back to the three Ds, you know, diplomacy, development being the, the big Ds, but his approach is to kind of do the defense and do the little D. And we do that, again, taking a step back, but doing it by, with, and through those 53 African partners that I talked about. So I did my in-brief with him. Uh, after He took command in August, and I had an in-brief with him shortly after that. And I talked to him about how do we collaborate, how do we share information and data with our African partners. And we do that through two different uh, venues. Through the J6, we do it through our, Mich our AFRICOM, uh, AFRICOM Mission Network, or AMNET. Uh, which is our mission partner environment. Um, but the problem with that is, is that when I came on board, it was an episodic capability. We stood it up uh, and we did it for an exercise and then we collapsed it down. And it really, really was just isolated at the headquarters and maybe with a couple of our key components. And I quickly identified that as, a, as an issue of how do we get something that can be persistent to get after what I talked about earlier, about sharing information, collaborating, but then also even from a C2 perspective, because when we need to reach out to those African partners for uh, any type of uh, event that may occur on the African and between humanitarian assistance, to countering BEOs, to hostage rescue, so on and so on, we need to be able to reach out to them quickly and collaborate, share information, but then also uh, hopefully get a decision or support on what we want to do down on the continent. So, and then we also tr took the approach of, we were trying to get that at the, at the SIPR rel level, which that's great um, for certain partners, but for the majority, that just is not feasible because secure comms for a majority of our African partners is probably Gmail and, and WhatsApp. So how do we get past that? So we currently, uh, as I work uh, with the J2, we have uh, uh, four bilats and one multilat. So that's only really six African partners that we have the ability to share SIPR rel information with. So that leaves 47, my Minnesota public education math is good, 47 other African partners that we need to try and share information with. So as I reached out to partners, I reached out to old friends, old coworkers, reached back into where, you know, in the different communities that I've worked with, I was like, hey, maybe we need to take a step back and look at deploying a mission partner environment at the IL-2 level, at the very commercial level. Because then we can get after well, like what Dr. Iyer talked about, leveraging commercial industry and commercial capabilities that are much more rapid, much more easily to be stood up, uh, and then much more easily deployable and extended out to our African partners. So that's the kind of the approach we're taking towards it because one, that then gets it to them, that capability to them much easier. 
It also builds trust in being able to share that information between partners. Uh, but then it also builds proficiency and talent in our African partners because let's be frank, not all are created equal and some just don't have the capacity, the capability or the commitment to share that information that we need to. So that's kind of the approach we're taking towards it. But of course, it's all got to be built on zero trust uh, uh, principles and the zero trust uh, pillars because that's the cybersecurity framework that the DOD is, is driving us towards and absolutely what we need to do. So, uh, and I will also say the, the last point I'll make is as we look at building out ca uh, capability and capacity, we've got to get away from these network centric models and move towards a data centric model of how we distribute and share information. And I think it's as very much in line with Dr. Iyer said as well is about that, that digital ecosystem where you put information out there, data that is out there, that then is being able to be accessed through roles or attributes that you assign to those individuals that are trying to access that information or data, uh, and then they can only get to that. But then what that requires us to do is, is the data producer or the information producer is to make sure we're labeling it properly, make sure we're tagging it properly. And I know this may come across in the Intel community a little differently is make sure we're classifying it accordingly. Uh, and I joke around a little bit about that because it seems like we always want to overclassify something. The holiday social event always has to be put out on JWIX for some reason, I don't know why. But it just seems that's, that's the easy button and we got to get away from that, especially if we want to sh be able to move data at the speed that we need to, to make sure it's impactful uh, and makes a difference for our, our mission partners, but then also our commanders. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Liz Durham Ruiz. I'm the J6 at United States Strategic Command. I've been there for about four years. For those of you who may not be aware, U.S. Strategic Command or STRATCOM is located, located off at Air Force Base, Nebraska, which is near Omaha, Nebraska, which is just about in the geographic center of the continental United States. And at the time when STRATCOM, previously Strategic Air Command, was established, there was a reason for that. The, the idea was to have it as far from each coast as we could. So uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Mr. Cosson and the entire team for giving me the invitation to come speak today uh, and, and kind of tell you some of the things that are on our mind out at U.S. Strategic Command. So a little bit about U.S. Strategic Command. We're responsible for assuring strategic deterrence and being prepared to respond with the nation's nuclear arsenal should strategic deterrence fail. So it's a mission that's it's kind, of an, it's kind of a big deal. We think it's kind of a big deal. Um, and, and as our, our commander, uh, our commander uh, General, General Cotton, General Tony Cotton took over as commander of U.S. Strategic Command last Friday, uh, what we are charged to do within the J-6 is just make it all work like a light switch 24-7, 365 under the worst conditions that any of us would ever want to, want to experience, right? So a little bit different than what my teammate here at, in AFRICOM has to deal with. We, our, our partners, if you will, are really um, many partners. So we've got to work directly with the services because the services provide us the weapon systems and the command and control, the very tailored nuclear command and control systems that we depend upon to execute the mission. Uh, that's part of our partnership. But the other partnership we've really been leveraging uh, extensively and, and even more so as uh, within recent years, especially since uh, we've moved into our new command and control facility is our partnership with the intelligence community, our partnership with the IA, our partnership with all of the combatant commands um, going forward. Uh, and, and you heard, if you were here yesterday, you heard both Mr. Sherman and General Skinner talk about nuclear command control communications or NC3. That's a, that what NC3 is, for some of you who may not be aware, is a portfolio of, of 204 elements, or if you, if you count it by IT systems, there are 92 different distinct IT C4 systems that we manage as an enterprise. Uh, and that's, those are the systems that we need to depend upon uh, for doing our actual mission on a day-to-day -day basis. That's in addition to the seven networks that we depend upon. The networks are, you're, we're talking Nipper, Sipper, JWIX, and, and several other networks that we depend upon to do our mission. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a rich environment. So I wanted to maybe 
provide a couple remarks along the lines of the theme of this panel, which is trans tra uh, transcending strategic comp competition through innovation, adaptation, and collaboration. So st st trans uh, transcending strategic comp competition. Our strategic competitors right now uh, are, are really who you see on the global stage. Our previous commander, Admiral Richard, would, would tell you that never before in the history of this country have, has this nation been called upon to deter two nuclear-capable adversaries that must be deterred differently. So we spend a lot of time understanding our adversaries. I'm talking about Russia. I'm talking about China. Understanding those particular adversaries and how do we deter those adversaries differently. So transcending strategic competition, we do that a couple ways. First of all, through innovation. A little bit about of strategic command. One of the journeys that we were on recently, in about 2016, we had a catastrophic flood at, off at Air Force Base that destroyed 60% of the base and the infrastructure that was there with it. It's a 100 years flood. Uh, some of you might have heard about it in the newspapers. But you would be surprised at the number of people that come up to me and say, we never, we never really paid attention. We didn't even know you were destroyed 60% of the base. Well, why is that? Because our systems are so resilient that we were able to operate through, able to operate through that 60% that catastrophic situation at Offutt Air Force Base. And at the same time, we were building a purpose-built command and control facility right across the street. So our commander at the time, we were supposed to have 18 months to get into the new facility. General Hyten, uh, who was our previous commander and then went to be the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said, I know you've, you're supposed to have 18 months. 60 days is the answer. Yes, 60 days. You will be in that building in 60 days. Okay, and, and we were in the building in 60 days. It was through a lot of partnerships, people at the base, people at, uh, at headquarters Air Force who really came to the, to the rescue and, and fielded a lot of our capabilities really very quickly, all of our SATCOM facilities. So all of that wouldn't have been, been possible without those partnerships. Partnership with DISA, our DISA teammates were just invaluable at getting those comm systems into that new C2 facility. So we had this purpose-built facility. We got over there in 60 days. Nothing works the first time you're in a new house. So it took us about a year to, uh, to, to tune all of the systems in there. Uh, and then we had this small thing called COVID. Stratcom is an organization. Uh, you, you, you talk a lot about using Google and, and public, you know, publicly available communications. That was not the Stratcom way. We did not telework. It just wasn't a thing. So 4,000 people in the Stratcom headquarters, because of the way that the facility was built, we were able to get everybody on telework on an unclassified system, all 4,000 in 10 days. Mm. And so that was really a, a huge partnership with, uh, specifically with this, uh, trying to get us on unclassified telework, and then with our partnerships, partnerships with folks in the intelligence community, and again with this, uh, trying to get uh, classified telework for us. So a huge innovation that, that took us a long way. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our industry partners who were there with us along the way also, providing us industry capabilities to, to jumpstart some of that as well. Um, secondly, adaptation. What, when I say adaptation, I'm talking about moving fast and demanding excellence. So moving fast, I talked about a little bit about the historic flood, uh, but, but talk about Russia-Ukraine just for a minute. You know, when, when the Russia-Ukraine crisis uh, kicked off, and we, and we at Strack, and we leverage our, everything we do is threat informed. We leverage intelligence for just about everything we do. So as we were watching the situation develop, about a little over a year ago now, we, you remember the nuclear command control system, that 92 system um, infrastructure, the enterprise that we have, we were trying to determine whether or not it was, it was ready. I mean, we were really expecting cyber attacks in, in that particular area of the world. So how do you ensure that it's ready? And we thought that was a good question. So we developed a readiness uh, situation, we, which we call this a readiness construct called NC3 conditions. And what it was, the more, most like force protection conditions where STRATCOM issued orders to our components and to others within the entire DODEN within leveraging CyberCom's uh, DACO authority. We leverage orders directing particular actions to be taken to harden the nuclear command control systems enterprise. It was a huge feat. Why was it a huge feat? We didn't really have good idea on who to send the orders to. Who does, the mes who does the message go to? I remember, you, you remember, Richard and I talked about this. Who does the message go to to get this order to Cheyenne Mountain? It was a good question. So it took us, took us about, uh, took us a good two months to, to implement our first NC3 condition. Fast forward to uh, just about a, a month ago, it was the 28th of November, I guess it was less than a month ago, we issued a, an order to go to a lower NC3 condition. 
and that order was issued and complied with in about 20 days. So an opportunity to harden the nuclear command and control enterprise by moving fast and demanding excellence. And I guess finally collaboration. I talked a lot about you know, the commander directing us, just, just make sure everything works like a light switch. That doesn't happen without partners. It doesn't happen without partners, like my partners in the COCOMs, my partners on the joint staff, my partners in, in DOD CIO, um, you know, the, Mr. Costa and his team, this a team, uh, many more, many more across the community and with our, our partners in industry as well. You know, we recently looked at JWIX. Stratcom depends a lot upon JWIX. When we, when we implemented our new command and control facility, one of the bedrock systems was JWIX. And previous, our old headquarters, you probably had, I don't know, maybe 50 JWIX terminals. They were all in the J2. The new C2 facility has got JWIX terminals on each and every desk. And so now um, we leverage JWIX on a, on, a, on a recurring basis, on a daily basis. In fact, we were co-authors of a 44-star memo that was published by the Department of Defense talking about the imperative to continue to maintain JWIX as a warfighting system across the, across the board, for not just for STRATCOM, but for all the combatant commands as well. So that was a huge watershed event, and we've been on that, that journey with our, our DIA teammates uh, to make sure that, that JWIX as a weapons system continues to be maintained and modernized. And I guess finally I'd like to just leave you with a, a thought about talent, just like everybody else, the war on talent. And so how do, we, how do we get that talent? First of all, when you talk about nuclear command control communications, they don't teach it in college. So you really have to get folks to come in and with those skill sets so we can teach them about the intricacies of that very complex infrastructure. But even things like data, artificial intelligence, we also are on the data artificial intelligence um, pathway. We've, we've got a, a pilot, so it's uh, actually about a year old now, where we are solving four uh, very complex mission-oriented problems, leveraging a commercial company to provide um, a, uh, analytics, to provide uh, algorithms based upon our data, which we don't have in the cloud, by the way. That some data we just don't put there yet. But, uh, but leveraging STRATCOM data to be able to solve very hard problems as well as intelligence community data, data from open source, bringing all that together to solve four very hard problems that Commander uh, Stratcom gave to us to solve. So um, we're always on the lookout for talent. Uh, from We have found being in Omaha, Nebraska, even though it is the geographic center of the country, it is not necessarily the talent hotbed for data, artificial intelligence, <laughs> or C4, sh shocking as it may be. So we are open to leveraging talent from many places remotely. In fact, our chief data officer is, uh, lives in um, Illinois, and that person is, we're able to leverage his skills to bring on board our data and artificial intelligence capabilities at US STRATCOM. So uh, those are just some of the things that uh, that we're doing and kind of where our mind is at STRATCOM, but I will tell you, if I can leave you with one thing, we at STRATCOM, especially in the joint J6, we are a warfighting J6, we are a warfighting CIO, uh, we are there right there in the foxhole with the J3 when we're doing the Russia-Ukraine or any, any um, activity, we are there on the battle deck right there with the warfighters. And in fact, I as the J6, not only am I the J6 as well as the CIO, but I'm also the deputy J3 for nuclear command control communications defensive cyber and space operations. So it's, it's very much a, a warfighting J6 mentality that we have at US STRATCOM within the J6. Thanks, and back to you, Richard. Awesome. Good uh, afternoon, I'm happy to be here. Let me pile on and uh, thank uh, the, uh, the host uh, uh, for inviting us, and inviting me specifically. You may not want to do invite me again next year, but, uh, but hopefully, uh, hopefully that won't happen. But also thank you for uh, being here as well. Um, but this is a really august group, uh, and I'm learning a lot just by listening to them. If you look at our title, the title our titles are pretty much the same, except there's a little bit of peculiarity on, on, on my title. Uh, I am also a CIO of the U.S. Space Command. I am also a uh, C4 plus cyber um, directorate, but we, we chose to call ourselves digital superiority for one reason. And that reason is um, we acknowledge and recognize, it's, it's actually not attributed to me, uh, acknowledge and recognize that the most of our maneuver for as a combatant command, US Space Command, most of our maneuver is done on the digital space. Um, we are the 11th combatant command, the youngest of the three here. Um, so and we are not the Space Force. 
uh, there's a common uh, misunderstanding of that, that we share the same last name, but uh, different first name. Uh, Space Force is one of our service component. We have also Army, comp uh, Navy, and of course, uh, Air Force component to our uh, 11th uh, combatant command. And uh, so, so in, in our, in our activities, most of our activities are actually done in space, but, but you also know that the, the space is not just for space sake. It is, uh, our, our commander is an Army commander, uh, General Dickinson. It will, will remind me that uh, the last ta tactical mile is important. Just because we see something and we don't get that information to the, uh, the, the last tactical mile to the, uh, the ground commander or the maritime commander or air commander, uh, it wouldn't work. So, so that's what we do uh, to make sure that not only the networks are, are established and resilient, robust, but also bringing those capability, whether we, we see, how we see things, how we measure things, how we uh, communicate things are all down sent down to, from, a, from the space down to the terrestrial base and from terrestrial to all the Alaska Taco miles to get uh, the commanders uh, supported with uh, what things they do. And those are the services we provide. There's the other part that we also do as a U.S. Space Command. We uh, block and tackle, if you will. Uh, what that really means is that we need to protect our space capabilities. Again, not just space things, but also terrestrial things, and also uh, from, from the, uh, the information being beamed down, if you will, to the, the, uh, our C2 nodes uh, terrestrially, and also from that, those nodes spread out to the last tactical models to all, everyone. We need to protect all those things, block and, um, block and tackle, if you will. So we do that as well. A lot of those uh, things that we block and tackle category, we don't usually talk about because of the classification. But, uh, but you can imagine what, what they really are. So another thing is that uh, we're, we're the, uh, again, we're, uh, we are the 11th, but that we are the largest combatant command. We're not measured by geographical combatant command, but, but astrographical. So, so everything above the 100 clicks uh, above is uh, basically our AOR. Uh, so uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the, the problem is that the, that AOR is not very friendly. In fact, uh, one of the things that I would ask, and uh, most of you already know this, is that um, at the unclassified level, the, uh, the one of the adversaries that we're looking at, Chinese, for example, the average age of their space assets, can you imagine what that is? Four years old. Hmm. You know what average space assets of our capability? 10 times that. So that creates a challenge from a data perspective and a network perspective, how to ingest vacuum tube information, couple it with a digital information, and blend it into the high definition capability to be able to then send it out all to the, the last mile to the, our, our, our commanders at the, each echelon in real time, well, real time as measured by their operational uh, ops and tempo, if you will. That's very difficult. So, so digital superiority, i uh, come back to the digital superiority. Why is that so important for a U.S. Space Command? And that is important because what we're trying to create is exactly all the things that you have talked about. Data-centric, applying analytics, resilient, robust network, all those three things we need to do, plus all the other housekeeping things like cyber, uh, resiliency and uh, cyber defense, those kind of things, so that we can actually reach one thing for our commander. Uh, we are a combatant commander, so uh, we fight tonight, and that one thing we're trying to establish is to give him the decision dominance. I'm not the only one who said this already. Decision dominance at the combatant command level so that we can think, see things better, think faster, and command control our forces, quickly so that we can get inside of their decision cycle, so that we can deter them from doing something silly. And then when, when they want to do something silly, then we can actually persuade them not to or defeat them. Winning does matter. So, so that's part of the, the J6 uh, uh, mission from uh, U.S. Space Command. And I really love uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Liz, sorry, uh, Jerome Reese, uh, the, the last word. We are a combatant command. J6 is a com uh, operational uh, directorate of our combatant command because what we do, again, 
everything we do here in this space, uh, capability, uh, are through the digits. And, and we are right there with the J2 to make sure that we understand what kind of information can provide us and so we can inject those into the decision dominance equation. And then with J3, to make sure that uh, we can fight tonight and win, winning does matter borrowing from the army thing, and also five, uh, J5, so that we can actually partner with our allies. Uh, we are doing that globally, uh, with or without uh, allies having a space capability, because there are a lot of the interest in, the, in that uh, triad of space assets emanating down to the uh, C2, and then from C2 terrestrial distribution of the capability. Uh, so that's very important. And also, we also have, a, we stood up a commercial, uh, operating space uh, operating center, commercial space operating center in Colorado Springs. That's where we're at. Please don't ask me about the basic decision. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, that commercial operating uh, center is actually ingesting all the commercial data, space data, and helping us do our mission. And one of the mission, primary principal mission we're looking at is a space domain awareness. Not just about talking about you know what, what objects are flying around and that's so that we can avoid them. That's interesting. Uh, that's good for making movies like Gravity, for example, so that we don't get hit by them. Um, but but we're also space domain awareness is important. Importance of the SDA space domain awareness is making sure that we understand what those objects are, are where they're at, and what they can do. Kinetically and non-kinetically. Uh, so uh, the, we're, we have the joint uh, commercial office operating uh, our operational center to ingest those data, to share those data with our allies and, and uh, mission partners as well, uh, and then be able to correlate those kind of data with our uh, data from classified. So again, uh, another uh, key point to take away from uh, data-centric discussion about how do you do that with, with the all domain or all classification levels so in, in a way that uh, we can facilitate decision dominance. But anyway, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm a Longhorn grass, so it's really, you know, it's a stone away from uh, my alma mater. Uh, and uh, in about two weeks' time, I think they're gonna come down here to Alamo Dome and do some uh, uh, playing football. So I'm looking forward to that as well. But thank you for having me. And uh, I'm really impressed with our panelists and for uh, learning from what they're doing as well. So looking forward to the Q&A. Right. Yes, thank you for your comments. Um, given that we are standing between these fine people and lunch, <laughs> I think we should move directly to question and answer. I had some prepared ones, but I think the ones the audience gives us are always the, uh, the best ones. So. Or we've stunned you into silence. <laughs> Are they ready for lunch? All right, we did have one question earlier from the audience. It happened during the J2 panel. Uh, that was, I thought, very interesting. And I think that we probably have a different perspective on it. So the question was related to the application of wireless technology uh, and the importance of that particularly at the tactical edge. So I thought Colonel Phillips, uh, given AFRICOM's perspective with all these partners and uh, you know, the variety of the environment, uh, that that might be a question that you could t take a stab at. Okay. Um, so I know as we talk about anything uh, as far as wireless into collateral spaces, into SCIFs, that seems to always be a, a non-starter. And, I, and I, I completely understand that. But I think we need to take a look at policy to see is there is it time for change when it comes to that. So um, being in some of the communities I have been in, uh, that is a capability that has been allowed uh, to be able to be utilized because of the ongoing operations, the, the need to be able to work uh, simultaneously in different environments or different spaces that you may be in. Uh, like a conference or in an OPT or something like that, and being able to take the device off your desktop and bring it into where you're going to be working out of and being able to utilize that. I think it's that's something that we should be able to take a look at. But then take that from a tactical application standpoint and take it down to the continent, and especially as we start looking at 5G capability uh, and being able to put mobile devices or um, a BYOD type environment where they'd be able to bring in the, that capability and allow 
users to access uh, capabilities, resources, services much more rapidly and in a secure means, I think it's something that is definitely advantageous for us. Okay, great. Did we get any questions now? Uh, no. No. All right, so I will just be loud. Um, it worked. So we really appreciate, first of all, we really appreciate uh, the relationship between the J6 and the J2. Thank you very much for, for all your support and, and working with us and, and helping us with many things. I know Stratcom specifically helped us out with GC, G, GCC SIQ. Thank you very much. Um, that's one of our, our fundamental capabilities. Dr. Iyer talked a little bit about how we were going to start to create what I call a, a distributed cellular structure, where we're going to have com command and control distributed out in uh, different locations. From a strategy, from a J6 standpoint, what do you think are the, the where do you think we can go with something like that, and, and how would you implement that in your in your environment? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so having uh, had some good, very good discussions with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Randy Lineman, who's the 101st G6, and if you don't know, he, the 101st Airborne Division is the division that's operating right now in Romania and Poland uh, in support of uh, the, the operations that are going on there. And he described the environment that he op has to operate in as far as a very small size elements, and it's because C2 nodes are, are, are an HPT. Uh, for the enemy, and how do we operate in that? So much more smaller presence in a C2 capability, but then also how do you maintain that um, small presence and signature from a spectrum standpoint when you have all of these government furnished uh, systems, programs of record, um, and the approach that he has taken is, is if it can't be reached from a, a distributed network or from a cellular or a SATCOM or it, in a cloud per se, then it is something that just they cannot afford to, to take with them because of that smaller signature uh, and spectrum signature they need to, to maintain. So uh, it's been a big, that was very enlightening to me and I think it's something that we as a six working with the J2 and also really the commander of understanding what that commander needs as far as capabilities to be able to make it, that decision at the time and place that they need. Yep. I think this is very much a conversation that is, is happening now. So actually, if I wasn't here, I was going to be at a summit at DISA that's happening concurrently called Security Interoperability at the Tactical Edge. And that summit is tackling some of these issues about you know, how do we interoperate and yet remain secure in these environments when we're incorporating 5G and other technologies to achieve this distributed C2, right? How do we move that data from you know, an army unit through an Air Force network to a uh, Navy ship? Right? How do we do these, these handshakes and how do we interoperate in this way that uh, the, the joint warfighting concept tells us that we need to be able to do, right? to have this immediate flexibility. So um, I, I don't think we have an answer, but I think there is a lot of effort going towards working on it. To, to, add, to add to that, I think the one thing that we need to start looking at trying to leverage is, is commercial infrastructure. You know, you talked about, well, uh, an army network or an army service through an air force network to a navy navy network possibly i think there's a there's as i look at the african continent where we don't have uh, large uh, uh, commercial transport providers beating down our door to provide networks and uh, transport across the continent how do we leverage commercial vendors for that through cloud and utilize their transport infrastructure to move the data, like Dr. Iyer said, regardless of what classification that data is, but move it from where we produce it to where we need it. Let me just say maybe a couple things from a, from a U.S. Strategic Command perspective. Uh, distributed command and control structure is something that we've been doing at U.S. Strategic Command for years. And, um, our mission, we, we take our direction uh, from the President uh, and and and, and all the combatant commands do in accordance with the unified command plan, but I'm talking on a daily basis. We have to be ready to employ forces, and the, the president is the one who must direct us to employ forces. So we have a very specific 
infrastructure that allows us to ensure that that communication can take place with the president, with his combatant commanders, with, with uh, uh, the director of national intelligence, and whoever else the president needs to have in that conversation. That infrastructure is already in place, and we, we use it every single day. In fact, we exercise it over 400 times a year just at U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, and so from a distributed command and control perspective, uh, we have purpose-built systems that have been employed for decades. We're in the process right now, our Nuclear Command Control uh, Enterprise Center, on behalf of Commander Stratcom, is looking at the next generation of Nuclear Command Control Enterprise systems, some of which are there today. Some of the space systems are already filled today, and that's going to be what we have going forward into the future. But some of them we're looking at mesh networks, working more with commercial. If we were to take a greenfield approach, what would that look like? While we still make sure that the, that, that communication that decision-making capability up to and including the president can take place 24-7, 365 under the most dire conditions. So, uh, but, but we are also mindful that, that uh, the infrastructure that we developed decades ago, there are now more modern capabilities that can be leveraged. Commercial industry's got a lot of uh, capabilities that are now out there. For me, talk about mesh networking, talk about cloud computing. I joked a little bit that we, we don't do cloud computing. Well, we're trying, we're, we're, we're getting there, right? We've got our nipper net into cloud which is huge for us, uh, but, uh, you know, trying to, to leverage more of those diverse capabilities for command and control, I think, is where we as a combatant command are going as well. If I may just add to it, this is awesome uh, input. Uh, the one of the things that I would like to add is that we are learning combatant commands. Uh, so so uh, the, what's happening in Ukraine, for example, we learned a lot a lot, uh, things that we didn't uh, think that we were going to learn, but we learned a lot in a positive way. Uh, so, uh, so all the things that we talked about, absolutely, the mesh network, commercial applications and all that wonderful things, uh, hiding in plain sight, absolutely, we're, we're doing all of that. The key, the key is that uh, we have a great robust people uh, in our warfighters, right? They're smart, they know what to do, how to do it, and our, our our role is to provide them the timely information that they need so that they, uh, they can be better. And, and there's a lot of means to that end, and all the means that we talked about so far. So uh, uh, anyway, just one, one, one thing to mention, that commercial partner is, is critical to uh, what we do in the U.S. Space Command, and we'll learn that as well with the U Ukraine situation. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think we are actually we are at 48 seconds, um, so I am going to cut off any further questions, but uh, if any of our panelists want to stay afterwards, I'm sure we can, we can take questions as well. So thank you very much uh, for having us all. Oh, hey, hey, one last, uh, before she uh, turns it over back to you to have lunch, thank you so much to our commercial partners that are here today or this week as well. A, you bring uh, those opportunities, those those really those capabilities that maybe we're just not looking at at at, a, at the current time and place. So please continue to bring those to us because it's always an opportunity and and uh, trying to solve the problems that we're presented on a daily basis. So thank you for being well, here as well. And, and I guess I'd pile on to that. If you if you think you came and told us what you've got two years ago, <laughs> come tell us again, yeah, right? Well, because yeah. in some cases. Because to Mr. Mr. Yu's point, we've learned a lot from Russia, yep. Ukraine. So maybe, you know, as being learning combatant commands, maybe we're going to think differently. So don't yep. don't give up on us. And the last word I would offer is that we're still recruiting. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're three years old. And we're still recruiting. So anyway, thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Schumann and the panel members for that engaging discussion. Uh, this now concludes today's plenary speaking sessions. We'll see you back here tomorrow uh, in the afternoon after the breakout sessions in the morning. Thank you. <laughs>